Hello and welcome to the RPG Blender, where we give lesser played games and forgotten settings the roll the dice they deserve. I am your host, Game Master George, and yes, thank you, I did enjoy my vacation very much. It was marred slightly by starting off with someone deciding to try to merge the front of their car with our open car door, but thankfully our car walked away looking a little bit better than theirs did. Anyway, if you've been watching this channel for a while, then you know that I am usually fairly critical of companies who choose D&D purely as a marketing method, taking a wholly inappropriate concept and forcing it into the bundle of Dungeons and Dragons. At its core, Dungeons and Dragons is a tabletop skirmish game. There are rules for stuff outside of combat, but if you look at the books, you'll notice that a huge majority is devoted to combat. As such, you should expect that combat will be a fairly intrinsic part of your game. Meanwhile, we have Studio Ghibli Films. Studio Ghibli Films, and no, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that name correctly. I never know if I'm pronouncing any name correctly. Anyway, Studio Ghibli Films are usually more about interpersonal connections. While there are conflicts and combat, the majority of films deal with social scenarios, investigations of strange, otherworldly entities. In short, while combat is a thing in Studio Ghibli films, it is not one of the core elements. Editor George here, just a quick note to let you know that yes, I am aware that some of their videos are extremely shockingly violent. However, those are outliers, not the norm. And from the aesthetic being created by this project, it's very clear that those are not the ones that they are attempting to emulate. And in fact, there are messages included often about how war is devastating, not just to the victims, but the people who perpetrate it. So you know what seems like a great match? A Studio Ghibli film and Dungeons and Dragons. You don't agree? Well, the folks over at 1984 Games certainly do, and have just released their Kickstarter project, Obojima Tales from the Tall Grass, a 5e campaign setting. As you can tell from the screenshot, they have already well blown past their funding goal, so I have no worries about impacting their success. Because as I always say, my fun is not necessarily your fun. If this is the kind of thing that you would enjoy as we go through this, then by all means go and back it. And truth be told, I don't even know that I won't like it because I have not yet looked at this. We're gonna go through it together right now and see just what this is all about. Before we go any further, remember to drop that subscription if you haven't already, if you'd like to learn about more non-D&D games. All right, so let's take a look at this campaign. It has already raised 143,000 dollars out of its ten thousand dollar goal i'm willing to bet that that ten thousand dollar goal is a bit of an undershot for what they would actually need to produce this hardcover massive book and it is a tactic that is used by some kickstarters in order to be able to get that coveted funded within one hour or within 15 minutes badge regardless they have acquired more than enough money to produce this concept but they do have a video here so let's take a look explore brew discover All right, so that was the video. It didn't really tell us much of anything. If we're on an island, spirits roam freely, there's darkness coming. Probably didn't even show you the video because there was very little of substance to actually show you. But anyway, this is a campaign setting, so we're not expecting to see much in the way of rules, which is usually where I would focus my attention. So in this case, I would like to see more as we go through this Kickstarter, how they are utilizing the 5e mechanics in this seemingly very disconnected concept. 1985 games, Obojima, Tales from the Tall Garden. All right, so all new mechanics for potion crafting. I will say if you've actually made some good potion crafting mechanics, that is a big selling point. Older editions of Dungeons and Dragons actually allowed you to do a lot more crafting stuff in your systems. Uh, in the 5th edition, they really stripped out a lot of that. So if you could actually make interesting potion mechanics, that's something that is applicable outside of the setting. 130 ingredients and 180 potions to craft, 8 new subclasses, 3 new races, 50 new spells, 60 new monsters, 50 new magic items, the hero's journey boon system, new feats and fighting styles, 8 new familiars and familiar mechanics, 20 new weapons and weapon mechanics, and 10 chapters on the world and lore of Obojima. A 250 page campaign setting inspired by the wondrous worlds featured in Studio Ghibli films and the beloved Legend of Zelda game series. I, I will say there's not much that has 
indicated Legend of Zelda to me. I have seen definitely the Studio Ghibli inspiration in their artwork, but Legend of Zelda, not so much. Guide your players through breathtaking locations, encounter strange spirits, discover rare oddities, and battle wild and wondrous creatures. Are they going to give us any kind of indication about this stuff? Or is it all just going to be talking about it in abstract? Tall grass, a world built for exploration and adventure. Lose yourself alongside your players as you travel the breathtaking island of Obojima, a curious place with a mysterious past. Uncover a wizard's vending machine and strike a bargain with their merchant cat. Pages and pages of rich lore. So they're talking again about this stuff, but let's actually get some examples here, please. All right, we're going to learn about potion brewing now, maybe. 100 plus ingredients spread across the island and combine them to create custom potion recipes with over 100 potions to brew you'll be a seasoned adventurer before you've crafted them all. craft your own recipe by combining ingredients you find on your adventure like a hill dragon egg a boom berry or a floppy disk the corruption foul magic has begun to spread across obojima's eastern coastlines the sea has turned black the waters have begun to poison the sea life and corrupt the land rumors have spread amongst the spirits but few claim to understand what's taking place on this strange island okay player options play as an eclectic college of masks bard and craft versatile theater masks to help you in any situation breathe life into paper constructs and control the battlefield as an origami mage or harness the potent magic that has slowly begun to infect obojima as a corrupted ranger can we actually look at any ah <sighs> come on Make these actually big enough so we can see what any of this is. Creatures create unforgettable creature encounters using any of 60 new monsters found only on the island of Obojima. See if your players can catch the elusive and playful sheep dragon or stay hidden as the dangerous and cruel Urugu Uragama haunts the roads between the villages. Find some of these creatures and more in our playtest material below. Good. We're going to want to take a look at that. Artist, I... I'm not going to complain about the art. The art is fantastic. $30 for the PDF. Oof. $60 for the book and PDF. I, I want to see this. The where's the play test? There we go. Free, free play test material. I want to grab an idea of what's inside the book. Let's take a look at what we've got. This is not much of a play test. It looks like it's a few uh, little PDF preview pages. Okay, let's take a look at potion brewing. Each ingredient holds a unique set of attributes that help determine what kind of potion will, be, will most likely be used to craft. Whimsy is uh, is the association with magic. Combat is association with power. Utility is association with man and the item's usefulness. Okay. Each ingredient has a number assigned with those three attributes. The three different types of potions, whimsical, combat, and utility. If all three of your ingredients have higher combat attributes you'll most likely brew a combat potion every potion has three main ingredients that are used to determine the effects of the potion to understand which you use you need to find the sum of the attribute type so if we take these three it gives us a whimsy score of six a combat score of 18 and a utility score of 18 oh 19 19 that's a six not a five okay whichever is the highest will determine which category of potion you brewed and what number potion Okay, so that's interesting. So you combine that, you see what the highest attribute is. In this case, it is the utility attribute, which means you're gonna get a utility potion. You then look at the chart and you see that it's going to give you a potion of twin vision. Doesn't really matter what that does right now, but the idea is sound. You're then looking for these ingredients. Each ingredient has that. And when you decide you want to make a potion, you find out what the number is and you need to combine three ingredients in order to get that number and have that number be the highest. This is actually a very interesting way of handling potion mechanics without making it too fiddly. I have to say, I actually like this potion system. It has nothing to do with Dungeons and Dragons. It would be just as home in any other system. I would actually consider using it for another system. Reviewing this just on the merit of this being a potion crafting system, I actually like it and would consider backing it. But unfortunately, it is priced as a full campaign setting for Dungeons and Dragons, which makes it a little harder to stomach. So let's go take a look at some of the Dungeons and Dragons pieces. What we've got here, Uragama, Medium Spirit, Neutral Evil, Armor Class 15, Terrifying La Laugh and Wicked Masks are so well known, children's rhymes are written about them. These evil spirits have been said to attack travelers after their fire has gone out. So a common superstition held by many merchants is to keep your fire burning through the night. That's the fluff of this monster. Let's see how well they've integrated that fluff into the monster itself okay it has resistance to lightning thunder bludgeoning it has nothing okay so it is resistant to most things except fire the fluff is talking about this as if these are separate creatures but then when you actually look at the mechanics it's one real creature and the rest are illusions what we have here is absolutely nothing related to that fluff that we just got why it goes after fire is out it should have some kind of weakness to fire or an inability to approach uh, lit torches something to actually match the fluff to the stat block as it stands it's just a generic monster with 
an interesting little tidbit of when it will attack. All right, let's take a look at the sheep dragon now. These playful creatures are known to live among the rolling hills alongside livestock and other grazing beasts. Although their name and serpent-like body may confuse some, the sheep dragon is not a dragon, but rather more akin to a dog. They aren't known to be violent, but they do have a variety of tools to protect themselves when they feel they're in danger. So then when we look at that, we should have some things in its stat block to indicate it's more playful nature, things that it would be using outside of combat rather than just pure violence. Skills, it's skilled at perception. It has dark vision. Whenever it passes a creature that is within five feet, make a strength check or be pulled 10 feet in the direction and knocked prone. There's nothing about this creature when you look at its stat block that gives any indication that it is anything but just another monster that you should fight. You need to back up your lore with the mechanics of your game. This creature is supposed to be playful. Yet any time it moves next to somebody else, it knocks them down and drags them along with it. That's not exactly playful, but that's the closest we have to something that is identifying about it. Let's go take a look at these subclasses. We have the College of Masks. When you join the College of Masks at third level, you can weave arcane boons into theater masks. There was a subclass in 3.5, I don't remember if it was third or 3.5, where you would make masks which you put on to get special abilities. So I'm going to guess that this is a bit of a resurrection of that. So what do these masks do? Box gives you the ability to move through any spaces. Golem gives you increased melee range. Banshee, while wearing this, you can do speak with dead or temporarily move through the ethereal plane. So right here, we have an illustration of the problem. Almost all of these abilities as described here are pertaining to combat. And as I've mentioned, that's right for Dungeons and Dragons. Dungeons and Dragons is primarily about combat, but Studio Ghibli films are not. The extent of the inspiration for Studio Ghibli is the images, all the superficial things. You're getting none of the depth, at least from this preview. Again, this is just a preview, so I can't say with certainty that the full setting wouldn't expressly deal with these things, but from what we're seeing here, all we get is combat. All we are finding is how you can use this setting as a new way to go kill new unique monsters, not as a way to explore the themes that you find in a Studio Ghibli film. And that's the extent of the preview. Obviously this game is going to be very successful in its Kickstarter. It already within the first day has 165,000. It's gained $20,000 in the time that I've been recording this video. Would I back this? No, no, I would not. I enjoy Dungeons and Dragons. I am not a Dungeons and Dragons hater, but I think that it is overused. And I think that this game is one of the examples of why. And that's why I wanted to talk about it here. This theme is not right for Dungeons and Dragons. This setting, if you took it and put it on a game like Golden Sky Stories or Rutama, would be a perfect fit. And honestly, if this setting appeals to you in general, I would recommend you might actually want to pick this up and ignore all the stat stuff, just get the setting and use it in a more appropriate game. And the crafting itself is fairly system neutral. You could use those mechanics in any system you like. You would obviously have to rewrite the effects of the potions for whatever system you're playing in, but that's fine. If you like the potion mechanics and the tiny little snippets of lore that we've been given, quite frankly, this is a campaign setting and we know very little about the actual campaign setting, then this could be a good one for you. But as I said, I would not back this. It feels like another attempt to take a possibly interesting concept and force it into Dungeons and Dragons because that's the popular game. This is your idea of a good time? By all means, back the game and enjoy it. But just remember that you might have a better time if you take what you get from here and put it into a more appropriate game. That's it for today. Thank you for coming in for this short little video. There's more stuff coming now that I'm back from vacation. I've got some uh, stuff in the pipeline that'll be coming out soonish. So stay tuned for more. Anyway, that's it for me. Thank you for tuning in. And remember, there's gaming outside the Forgotten Realms.